All right, thank you, everyone. It's, I've really been enjoying this conference. Actually, I'm filling in for uh, David Haynes, who's, uh, who's listed as the person who's supposed to be giving this conference, um, this, this presentation. Um, he handles uh, Questa Games competitions. He works for Questa Game, um, and he's sort of the, the brains behind setting up a lot of our competitions. Um, what I really want to talk about now is just this idea of competitions for citizen science. Uh, it's something that we started experimenting with about a year ago, um, and uh, and I thought I'll show you some of the results. Um, but to get started, I'll just give you a sense of what Questa Game is and what a competition kind of looks like. So if this works, ah, do you know how this works? <laughs> All right. Well. Um, so basically, this was an example of a competition that was held at Sunshine Coast Botanic Gardens. Um, and what they did is they basically used Quest Game, which is a, an app that gets people outdoors, um, taking photos of things. Um, and they were actually, uh, you get scored uh, basically on the rarity of what you found. It's got some algorithms it's connecting with the uh, biodiversity databases and it figures out, oh, what you found is actually really rare in that area. And then you also try to identify stuff and you learn how to identify stuff and you get points for that as well. And it's a competition. So you, they, this uh, botanic garden, they had some rewards. They had a river cruise kind of thing and free groceries and stuff like that for the winners. Uh, so that's kind of just gives you an overview of what, a comp, what, it, what we mean by a competition, right? So some of the challenges for citizen science are obviously the data quality. I've, I've talked about this earlier. Um, and there's not enough expertise, right? Um, there's also volunteer fatigue. And I, I wonder, we, I don't know if that's come up much in this conference. Uh, just the idea that uh, <coughs> volunteers can only do so much, right? And they may get tired. Um, and then the question of the scientific value of, of the data. Um, so, so competitions c might address some of these issues. Um, the first one that we had was the Great Australian Biodiversity Challenge. We think this is the largest bio blitz that's ever happened in Australia. Um, it, was, it was nationwide. It was part of the um, National Science Week. Um, and it was basically a, a week-long event. Um, and what we did that was kind of interesting here, we experimented by creating teams. You signed up for a team, and you got to choose your botanic garden. So all the botanic gardens around Australia were engaged in this activity, and they were promoting it to their visitors. Um, and it actually went really well. So we got quite a lot of sightings. This was just one week. What's really interesting is the number of identifications that came in. There was quite a lot of engagement with people going, what is this thing that's been found? Um, and we had 864 species mapped over that time. One of the interesting things with having these teams is that we could see, like there was um, the top organization for identifications, you can see is, is a really small botanic garden. Um, the Friends of the Lismore Rainforest Botanic Garden. Has anyone heard of Lismore Rainforest? I hadn't heard of it before, but they just killed it. <laughs> They were able to identify all kinds of stuff. Um, and John, I, you guys did really well too, but uh, the Botanic Garden. Um, but you know, it was just great to see that, that one uh, sort of remote garden that nobody's really heard that much about was able to uh, score first place in this thing. And it was a really ex exciting event. Um, so here you can see we have, uh, for that competition, we had top spotters, and you can see how much was earned, each person earned. Again, each sighting is diff scored differently depending on the rarity. We had top identifiers. The, the winner of that, the Austin, who got first place, he's uh, 11 years old. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we had a full gamut of, of uh, age ranges, all kinds of people engaging in this. And it was kind of fun to see what was most spotted and sort of the top sightings and stuff. So then we got started getting contacted by a lot of different groups saying, hey, we want to run some competitions. And one of them was Parks Victoria. They're actually interested in citizen science, but for them, they have a, a slogan that goes, um, healthy parks, healthy people. The idea being that um, if we get out into parks more, it's really good for mental health um, and just general health all around. And that's what they're really trying to promote is to get people into their parks more. So for this competition, we had to do things slightly differently. They wanted it so that 
the, the sighting only counted if you found it in that park. So we had to create a map and started creating these zones, and then the system had to know, oh, it was found in that park, therefore it counts. And they also wanted quests for each of the parks. So once the person goes to the park, they open up Quest a Game, which is our app, and says, oh, there's a new quest here, join the quest, and these are five species that you need to find in the park. And it was all about getting people engaged. Slightly different to the team's model than what we had before, it was a great experiment. They had run something like this the previous year using iNaturalist as their kind of citizen science app. So we thought we'd try a competition and, and see how that compared. Um, so this had only 261 competitors, um, which is a sort of a small, smaller number for us. Um, and it had lots of, it, but, it, but it did have lots of engagement. There was quite a lot of, people had a lot of fun with it. Um, again, Austin killed it. <laughs> it looks like that time he got, he got top spotter, so he was able to find a lot of cool things. Um, and, uh, and he got a top identifier as well, I see. Oh, very good, Austin. <laughs> Clever kid. All right. But... Uh, but so, so um, I, I just want to talk about uh, now some of the lessons that we learned uh, from this. Um, we definitely got new audiences. Oh, I'm just going to back up here for a second. There was a really interesting result here. And that is that Parks Victoria had all their rangers doing identifications on our system. Because that would help speed up the identifications, right? Austin beat them all combined. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so as far as the, uh, what we learned, well, you can engage new audiences. Competition really helped with that. There were new motivators that, that came about, and, um, and there was a, a sort of deep and cost-effective engagement. They didn't have to build a new app. They didn't have to do you know, all this design and sort of stuff. It was already there for them, um, and, and they made it really simple. So that, that was a, a positive thing. Um, some of the things we learned, that when they went to the parks, they had to actually join the quest. And sometimes that got confusing, and there was an added step there. And so we, that's, in design, you try to remove all these kinds of roadblocks, and that was one that we realized we need to get rid of. Um, the other thing we realized is that we can enable communities to do this rather than us doing it all the time. The communities could do it themselves. A, a really interesting thing here that I pointed out in a previous session was that we put this sightings limit on the number of sightings you could submit. That changed everything. Because now people could only get, like in this case, this person only has 23 sightings that she can submit for, for her account. To get more sightings, she had to go and identify some, some species. So it creates this loop, uh, and, which is really interesting. And we noticed that the quality of the sightings just started to skyrocket. We were getting really good quality information, not just some pigeon and <laughs> that you can hardly see. That's just a speck in the distance. Um, OK, so, um, so we're all in on the competitions right now. We're starting to feel good about it. Uh, we're, we're running competitions every month now. We just had a, the, an arachnid adventure. Seven new species of spiders were found that haven't yet to be described. Um, so that was actually a really interesting outcome. And each month we take a different category uh, and we run these. They're like, imagine them like uh, bio blitzes, but we call them bio quests. Um, we have one starting tomorrow. <laughs> uh, you might want to join the buzzing bonanza. It's, uh, it's uh, flies, uh, wasps, and bees. Um, you, there's a promo code there. If you want to use that, you get a special uh, deal. Um, and they get pro all the competitions have prizes. There's really cool things like T-shirts and all kinds of um, like little devices that you can attach to your phone and stuff like that. Um, and, and now we're having the big university competition. So this is going to be really fun. We've got lots of universities uh, signed up. Um, and this is starting in April. Um, and more and more, we're, we're expecting to have about 20 to 30 universities around the world um, competing against each other to map biodiversity on campus. Um, and so, yeah, the, and then the following year, we'd like to get that number to about 100 uh, universities. So this is, this is going really well. And we just had Monash University sign up yet yesterday, so. 
Uh, definitely Adelaide should get on board on this. I don't know if they were on the list or not. Um, so the point here is, is that there's a demand for this, right? And, um, and a lot of organizations, botanic gardens, universities, they want to run competitions and engage their communities, but they don't want to spend $100,000 to build an app and start designing all this stuff. So we just created this thing, or we're, we're making it a separate portal that people can go on to and just um, build the, the, the quest and the competition themselves. If they only want sightings in a certain area, you can draw it on the map. I only want sightings in a certain area. I, if you only want a certain kind of animal, you can say, I, we only want quests for this kind of animal. You can do all the things that we've kind of learned different organizations want. And that, that kind of works really well. So. That would be um, the, an example of someone who, who wants to engage com a com their community. They don't have an app. They don't want to go through that process. The next example is if you already have an app and you've already got people going out and taking pictures like the water bugs and all these ones I'm hearing about that are just so fantastic, our back-end system can now identify them for you using the same mechanisms that we're using, put, giving scores and making sure that they're accurate and going through double-blind peer review, which is what our, what our system does for every sighting that comes in. It's completely double-blind peer review system. Uh, so in, in we're all in on the games. <laughs> you can see uh, we've got uh, s school coming on board now with our new product, Ranger Vision. Look, the app is just an interface. Right? And people are excited about different kinds of interfaces. Quest game is fun. Ranger Vision works really well for schools. We're going to have a new one coming soon for aliens. Uh, it's going to be fun. Um, and, but what we're going to do with Ranger Vision, which is going to be really exciting, is we're going to let the schools compete. And, and we're getting a lot of feedback that, hey, we love Quest Game, and hey, we've got a school, and we're going to start Ranger Vision and doing all this. Can we compete against other schools? So. I think we're in and we believe in the, in the competitions. We think it's working. Um, and we're just going to keep exploring this and making it open to more and more uh, citizen science projects. Yeah, thank you.